beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who said this? I quote, Experience shows that the day of rest is essential to mankind, that it is demanded by civilization as well as Christianity. End of quote. And who said this? Sunday is a divine and priceless institution, the necessary pause in the national life. It is the birthright of every subject, our responsibility, privilege, and duty to hand on to posterity. Now, maybe it will surprise you to know that these quotes are from important world leaders. Only thing is that they're from world leaders of the last century. One was from an American president, Theodore Roosevelt, and the other is from a British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. Here's what another important British politician said a century before that, There is nothing in which I would recommend you to be more strictly resolute than in keeping the Sabbath holy. And by this I mean not only abstaining that day from all unbecoming sports and common business, but from consuming time in frivolous conversation, which often leads to a sad waste of this precious day. End of quote. Now it is hard to imagine our leaders today saying anything like this. Times have changed. Sunday is now a day of sports and business. Our leaders even pass laws that allow this and even encourage this. And so what is it that as radically changed how people treat the Lord's Day. Well, certainly two big influences that contribute to this are commercialism and hedonism. Let me explain what I mean by that. Commercialism means a concern with maximum profit. Life is about making money, and so if doing non-essential work gets you more money, that's what you do. This is one reason why many businesses will get extended trading hours in certain holiday seasons and, as a result, are open on Sundays. There are businesses that are legally allowed to trade seven days a week or year. Sometimes employees are even under pressure to work on Sundays. So that's commercialism. The other influence is hedonism, which means a concern with maximum pleasure. So life is about spending your money and enjoying your money. And let's be honest, we live in a wealthy society. Many people can afford to spend money and time in pursuing leisure. And so for many Sunday, in particular, becomes that day of sports or of amusement or playing golf or going fishing or spending the day at the beach or watching TV. Now, when you are chasing profit or pleasure, that inevitably comes at the cost of chasing the kingdom of God and the glory of God. And that is why the pressures of commercialism and hedonism have very much influenced thinking about the Lord's Day. Because if you replace the Lord God with anything else, whether it is money or whether it is leisure or anything else, inevitably you are going to replace his day with something else. And so at its heart, what we're seeing is a symptom of idolatry. 
and unbelief. But now let's bring this closer to home. This change of thinking that we witness in the world has an impact on the church. When I prepared this sermon, I was making a number of pastoral visits with the elderly in the congregation in West Albany that week. And so I asked a number of those who had been around long enough to remember how has observance of the Lord's Day in the church today changed from, say, 50 years ago? And here are some examples that were mentioned to me as things that, by and large, were unheard of then and just not done on the Lord's Day. Driving long distances on a Sunday between Perth and Albany and missing a service in church to do so. Going on holidays to places where you're away from any church services and sometimes even multiple weeks in a row getting changed into casual clothes after church, sometimes spending the afternoon at the beach, dressing casually when you attend church, not attending the afternoon worship service regularly. Now, that's not to say that these things never happened previously, but, so I was told, by and large, these things were rare and, for the most part, considered inappropriate for the Lord's Day. Certainly, it's good for, for young people who weren't around 50 years ago to, to hear this, consider this, speak to your grandparents, ask the senior members about it. What was it like? Few would disagree that standards of behavior have changed. Things are done today that were not done 50 years ago. And that's not to say that everything done 50 years ago was right or that everything done today is wrong. Our measuring stick is not how things were done at a certain point in history. Our measuring stick is the Word of God. Maybe other examples could be given that show improvement and even increased spiritual maturity in this area. Maybe some of the examples I mentioned are only specific to Albany and don't apply here. One person also commented that 50 years ago, there was perhaps a greater danger of legalism, which means that you have man-made laws and place them on the level of God's word. But if legalism is one danger in connection with the fourth commandment, then a danger from the other side is lawlessness, which means that you're not careful to observe God's law at all, where you're too free. And so if it is true that behavior has changed over 50 years, then the question does need to be asked, why? And are any changes, if there have been any, are they a reflection of growth in faith? Is it an indication that our service of the Lord is improving and that we're doing better as a church? Or let's make the question more personal. What does the way that you behave and what you do on a Sunday show and say about your faith, your obedience to the Lord? We have to be prepared to challenge ourselves with questions like this. And further, if the word of God demands it, then we have to be prepared to repent from sin and to make changes in our lives. But there is a deeper thing to consider Changes in behavior are nearly always a result of a change in thinking. Has our thinking about the Lord's Day changed? See, the world's behavior has changed because their thinking has changed. And so they pursue maximum profit or maximum pleasure instead of pursuing maximum obedience to the Lord. Their treatment of the Lord's Day says something about what is the center of their heart and the center of their life. It is a symptom of unbelief. Well, what about us? 
Does our observance of the Lord's Day show that God is the center of our heart, our life? Is it a clear indication of faith in him? Do we understand what God's special day is about? How do we see it? Is it a day of limits or a day of liberty? A day of drudgery or a day of delights? Is it a day that's like a gag to stifle you or is it a day that is a gift to celebrate? This afternoon it is this elephant element, the element of celebration that I will focus on. So I proclaim to you God's word as summarized and confessed by the church in Lord's Day 38 using this theme. In faith, receive the gift of the Lord's holy day of rest. And we'll consider that it's a gift because, firstly, of the spiritual focus of this day. Secondly, it's a gift because of the spiritual food of this day. Thirdly, it's a gift because of the spiritual fellowship of this day. And fourthly, it's a gift because of the spiritual foretaste of this day. So in faith, receive the gift of the Lord's holy day of rest. It's a gift because of the spiritual focus. Secondly, the spiritual food. Thirdly, the spiritual fellowship. And fourthly, the spiritual foretaste of this day. So first, the spiritual focus of this day. An older man who has since gone to be with the Lord remembered going to church three times on Sundays, 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m., and going to church once for a lecture during the week. And he remembered asking his dad, why do I always have to go to church? And his dad said, you don't have to go to church, you may go. Now, the point was, he wanted his son to think of it not simply as must, but as, as a privilege. Well, how do you see going to church? How do you see the Lord's Day? Sometimes we can be guilty of asking the wrong kinds of questions about this commandment. We want to know, why do we have to go to church twice? We want to know, what are we allowed to do and what are we not allowed to do? And certainly, while these questions sometimes can arise out of a desire to please the Lord, sometimes these questions can also be an indication of a wrong approach to the Lord's day. Because what we're really interested in is knowing where the limits are so we can get as close as possible to the edge without going over it. And we want to have as much freedom as possible. Because resting and going to church, it kind of gets in the way of our plans and sometimes it even is a nuisance. So we need to be honest with ourselves and ask, what is the thinking behind this? Is our attitude concerned with pleasing ourselves or pleasing the Lord? And we're looking to justify, when we're looking to justify missing worship services or looking to justify broadening our leisure on Sundays, what is behind that attitude? What is, what's going on in our heart, in our thinking, when we think about the Lord's Day and about church services in this way? Part of the cure is to see the Lord's Day for the blessing that God intends it to be. In his commandments, the Lord not only gives a command to rest and to keep the Lord's day holy, but he gives the reason for it. And the reason mentioned in Exodus 20 is a different reason than the one mentioned in Deuteronomy 5. Exodus 20 verse 11, the reason is this. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now this tells us that the Sabbath day of rest did not come into existence for the first time at Mount Sinai. In fact, we read of Israel celebrating the Sabbath even before they get to Mount Sinai, when they're in the desert 
They get manna every day except the seventh day. And so we'd understand the Sabbath has got its roots in God's pattern of creation. The Lord God, in his divine wisdom, organizes his work of creation in a particular pattern, a pattern that he wants his created human race as image bearers to follow. And so just as the Lord ceases from his work of creating and enters into an enjoyment of his creation, so mankind is to cease from his regular pattern of labor and enjoy rest. In fact, that's what the word Sabbath literally means. Ceasing, stopping, taking a break. Our regular pursuits need to be set aside and instead there's opportunity to focus on the Lord. So that's Exodus 20. But in Deuteronomy 5, verse 15, the reason is this. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. See, the fall into sin means that mankind is no longer able to live in the way that God intended by rightly focusing on the Lord. Redemption is necessary. And for Israel, this includes deliverance from bondage to Egypt. And for us today, it includes deliverance from bondage to sin. And so while Exodus links the fourth commandment to God's work of creation, Deuteronomy links the fourth commandment to God's work of Recreation. Our understanding of the day of rest has to be connected with the liberation that we have in Jesus Christ. God has given us this day as a, as a special celebration of the freedom from sin that he gives through Jesus Christ our Savior. And this is why a right understanding of the day of rest is not possible without soaking it, without drenching it, in the good news about Jesus Christ. Why do you think so many of Jesus' miracles of healing occur on the Sabbath day? It's because ultimately this special day points to life, to, to blessing, to liberty that he gives. This is his day. And this is the reason why in the New Testament we see the apostles gathering to commemorate this day on the first day of the week instead of the last day of the week. On the first day of the week, the Sunday, the Lord Jesus rises from the dead. He proclaims and he secures our eternal liberation from sin. And so resting doesn't disappear in the New Testament. But the meaning that it always had in the Old Testament is deepened, it's enriched, it grows. And so the New Testament gives the day of rest a new name. It's now the day of the Lord, the Lord's day. It's the day of the Lord Jesus. It's a day that celebrates the liberation that he accomplishes for us. A day that highlights the blessings of being delivered from sin and being restored as God's children in a relationship of love with God the Father through the work of the Son and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Certainly every day is to be God-centered, God-focused, but that does happen in a special way on the Lord's Day where our regular pursuits are set aside and we can focus on our God and we can celebrate the gospel of salvation. And this is why in the Old Testament already an important part of the day of rest involved public worship of God. In connection with the Sabbath, Leviticus 23 speaks of a holy convocation. In the New Testament, this is a day that we see the apostolic church gathering together. They're involved in activities of worship, including preaching, fellowship, giving gifts. And so we can conclude that today, too, it remains God's intention that this be a day with a spiritual focus. 
It continues to be a day of rest from our earthly labors and responsibilities. What a blessing to have a day off for spiritual refreshment. The Lord's day is not a holy hour or maybe two hours. It's a holy day. Further, what a blessing to be able to attend worship services, which, which are the climax and, and the high point of this day. This is the way in which we can give the Lord the spiritual focus that he wants and that he deserves. Sure, other things we enjoy in this day are good as well. Family time, fellowship, rest, all wonderful but in the end, they all take a back seat to what is truly important. The Lord's Day is like an oasis in a desert. And as we wander off into another week in the wilderness of life, we have opportunity to, to catch our breath, to refocus our thinking, to recalibrate our compass, to compare our spiritual priorities with God's word and so to focus on our relationship with him. It's a day we can set aside personal priorities and business so that our focus can be on the Lord. What we do in a church service is a very important part of that. I remember hearing about some of the early Dutch immigrants, who, many of whom, some of whom didn't understand a word of English, didn't get a word, didn't get anything out of the sermon in English, and yet attended even the English services faithfully because in so doing they would honor God. In preparing for this sermon, I also read about some members in a Reformed church who were completely deaf, but they faithfully went to church. Because there, they could still, with the people of God, worship God. In public worship, our hearts are turned away from the idols of profit and pleasure. And our hearts are directed to where they should be focused. The Lord, our God, our creator, our liberator. And so we focus on him by praying, by singing by listening, by giving. That's the spiritual focus of this day. That brings us to our second point, the spiritual food of this day. So we've established that the primary aim of the Lord's day is so we can focus on God, give Him glory. But is it only about giving? Sometimes we say it's better to give than to receive. And so sometimes it's even said we, we come to worship not to receive but to give. And yet that's not entirely true. Our worship of the Lord is not only a response to his work, but our worship of the Lord is even a result of his work in us. Even when we give. It is only possible because at the same time we are first receiving the grace of his Holy Spirit to work this in us. And so even in this act of worship, we are doing this because it is the Lord who is working in us. By the power of his Spirit, he's applying the benefits of Christ to us and he's directing our hearts to praise him. And so even when we're giving, we are receiving. But there's more we can say here. Because another important element of the worship service is the receiving of grace through the God-ordained means of the Word and the sacraments. The worship service is a covenantal meeting between God and His people. And that means there's two-way traffic. He is not only receiving praise, but He is also giving His grace and his spirit. If Sunday is an oasis, then the church service on a Sunday is the pool of water lined with beautiful palm trees where we can gather and drink and are filled by God himself and where our supplies are replenished. 
This is how the Lord works. He is particularly pleased to work and strengthen our faith through the official means of grace, the word and the sacraments. This is why the Catechism also reminds us of our responsibility to to diligently attend the Church of God. And this is why the very first thing mentioned there as part of the activities that happened in the Church of God is to hear God's Word. Now, in our modern era, for some, the explaining of God's Word as happens in a sermon would be considered old-fashioned. Preaching, outdated. But that is not what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul teaches us that it is by the folly of preaching that God is pleased to save sinners. Further, in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we are told that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the primary and the official means of grace that the Lord uses to work faith in our hearts is through the living preaching of his word. And because this day is the day of the Lord Jesus and the spiritual focus of of this day is on him, it will follow that the preaching also focuses on the work of Jesus Christ. He is going to be the focal point of the means of grace, which will direct our attention to the fact that our entire salvation rests on Christ's one sacrifice for us on the cross. And so we need to come because this is how the Holy Spirit will strengthen us in Him. And conversely, if we refuse to come when we're able to, we are depriving ourselves of this work of the Holy Spirit. In one place, I even read of a minister who suggested that staying at home from a church service without legitimate reasons is comparable to courting with sin against the Holy Spirit. What he meant by that is that this is the means the Holy Spirit uses to strengthen your faith. And you're making a deliberate choice not to do that. Now, certainly, there can be legitimate reasons why we can't attend the worship services. Maybe we're sick. Maybe we've got young children who need us right there. But even then, we will still try to make use of every means possible to ensure that we're well fed with the gospel. Maybe you listen to audio copies of services or watch it on video or you use babysitting nursery facilities. But if if you don't have legitimate reasons... Well, have you considered the impact this has on your spiritual health? There's a reason that we have catechism preaching one service every Sunday because this is going to ensure that we've got a well-rounded spiritual diet as as we work through the, the doctrines of Scripture. There's also a reason why a minister is called to apply God's word to a congregation he knows. God has given you a minister to bring you the word because that minister knows you. Imagine a mum who knows her children's health needs and every evening she makes another meal to ensure they get a balanced diet, that there's a good mix of meat and vegetables, maybe one day more of the one than the other. But now imagine just when mum has made a meal geared to the child's health needs that that child just doesn't show up, maybe just goes elsewhere, or worse, that child just skips meals altogether. Ministers can feel the same when they've prepared spiritual food that they know is needed. And when they see empty places in church, ones that should be filled. Eventually, an unbalanced diet and an incomplete diet is going to have a negative impact on your spiritual health. And that is why it's important to hear sermons regularly. Also, with that well-rounded doctrinal diet that we get, As a result of traveling through the catechism, through that afternoon preaching, 
And further, ideally, in your local congregation where your shepherd makes spiritual meals that will meet your needs. Now, to get the most of this spiritual food, we need to be chewing it and digesting it. Don't come with wrong expectations. Not every sermon will taste like dessert. Not every sermon will go down as smoothly and sweetly and easily as a good thick shake. Certainly there are churches, false churches, where you may get sermons like that regularly. It may taste good. That does not mean it's healthy. It can be too easy to say, well, the sermons are too hard. The sermons are too long or we're not in the mood for it. Well, sometimes a good steak requires extra chewing, doesn't it? Now, certainly a minister has his responsibility to make sure that the sermons are not like a watery soup or like a burnt, tough steak. That's his responsibility. But we have a responsibility to develop a good appetite. Sometimes we may not feel like eating, but it's still important to do. And so rather than criticize, we need to ask ourselves, do I hunger for the word? Do I see the value of the word for my spiritual nutrition? Am I making an effort to understand it, to work with it? Because that is the spiritual food God gives on this day. Thirdly, we consider the spiritual fellowship of this day. Because there's more blessing that God gives on this day. Fellowship. Now in the Old Testament, the psalmists often speak of the joy of going to the house of the Lord. And as part of that, they spoke of their love for the saints, the blessing of being in communion with brothers. The Bible teaches that our worship services have an important communal aspect. We do not worship God as individuals, but as individuals who are connected, a community, a congregation. Isn't this how God intends it? Because worship is not just about fellowship with him, our head, but it includes fellowship with each other, his body. Our connection with Jesus Christ creates a connection with every other member. And this is why we do not have miniature worship services with our families. Certainly family worship is nice, but it can never replace corporate Worship of a congregation. When Jesus Christ says in Matthew 18 that that he's in the midst of his people whenever two or three gather in his name, he was not talking about a group of holiday makers getting together for convenience instead of gathering in church. In the context, that verse is not about that. It's rather about an official gathering of Christ's lawful representatives. In fact, the particular context is about them gathering in the exercise of church discipline. And if it is going to be applied to worship, then it applies in the first place to the official gathering of the congregation under the supervision of office bearers, where we are not just gathering with the Lord, but also gathering with each other. This is an element that's also highlighted in Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25, when it says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Assembling of ourselves together. Jesus Christ did not come to save individual disconnected souls, but a people, a holy nation, people who know each other, people who care about each other, who support each other like hands and feet of a body, 1 Corinthians 12. 
We simply cannot obey the instruction to consider one another in order to stir up love and good works if we're not spending time together. Now, in the days of the Hebrews, this command was necessary because of the threat of persecution. Today, it is not the threat of persecution that hinders us from coming together. But perhaps other threats. The threat of the pursuit of profit or the pursuit of pleasure. The threat of luxury and leisure, selfishness or individualism. Do we still see our responsibility to come together for mutual benefit? Do we still see the need for us to receive from others the blessing of of support and care and encouragement? This is also why it's important to, as much as possible, attend our own local church. Unless, of course, there are weighty reasons to be elsewhere. Generally speaking, this is where we belong. And if we think we can just go it alone, we don't need others then are we not being disobedient to the Lord's intention for how his body is intended to work? And then do we not deprive ourselves of a wonderful gift, the spiritual fellowship of this day? Finally, and in our last place, the spiritual foretaste of this day. Finally, the rest and worship of the Lord's day gives us a foretaste of of the eternal rest that lies ahead. Hebrews 4 verse 9 says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. And this is one of the texts that the Catechism is referring to when it speaks about beginning in this life the eternal Sabbath. If you don't desire to to worship the Lord now, then what makes you think that you will want to spend eternity doing it? The taste we get on this day of rest and worship is a taste of eternity. And so how are we going to get the most out of this foretaste and what does it mean in practical terms? Well, maybe we would love it if we could have a person come to tell us exactly and infallibly what is and what is not permitted on the Lord's Day. I'm not that person. The Lord has told us all we need to know in his word, and that's what we need to work with. He does not treat us like little children who have to be told every little detail. He tells us the principles He calls us to see the Lord's day for the gift it is in Jesus Christ and to receive it in faith. Now at the beginning of the sermon, I mentioned some ways in which observance of the Lord's day appears to perhaps have changed over the last 50 years. So again, we need to ask, does this demonstrate that we are better understanding God's gift? How good a job are we doing of avoiding legalism? Or how much are we in danger of turning to lawlessness? Are we following our hearts and the world? Or are we following the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, what are some ways that you might receive this gift in a proper God-honoring way? Here are five ways. Number one, proper interpretation. Have a right perspective on the Lord's day. Have clear thinking about it so that you see it for the gift that it is. A beautiful spiritual focus, healthy spiritual food, upbuilding spiritual fellowship, and a delicious spiritual foretaste. We need to repent of following idols of commerce or leisure, profit or pleasure. We need to set our hearts on following Jesus Christ. And we need to teach our hearts to find our joy in him. Proper interpretation. Number two, planned 
preparation. If you're up late on a Saturday night or engaged with questionable pursuits on the day before, then you're going to show up in church with a tired body or with a polluted mind. And so it's important. Organize your week, live your life so that you can come to church with a well-rested body, with a receptive mind and with a clear conscience. So prepare. When you come, pray for God's blessing over the minister, over the services, over your participation, over the day. Planned preparation. Number three, diligent convocation. Be dedicated to public worship. Twice. Does your attendance suggest that it's just a part-time hobby that you can just switch on and off whenever it's convenient? Be faithful to the Lord's call. Ask yourself, what does the Lord require of me? As the Catechism says that I diligently attend the Church of God. Yes, this will require self-denial. It will require sacrifice. But see how this will result in blessing. Yes, it is a requirement. But isn't it wonderful that the Lord requires us to open His gift? There are times when you open a gift that there's lots of wrapping paper. But that is not a reason not to open it and not to enjoy it and delight in it. Diligent convocation. Number four, complete dedication. Be disciplined in setting aside your regular pursuits and labors for the entire day. And enjoy the rest and the break this includes. Use your time on this day constructively in fellowship with others or doing Christian reading. Don't let this be an empty day, but find ways to fill it with wholesome activity, complete dedication. And finally, number five, joyful celebration. See, from opposite sides, legalism and lawlessness threaten to destroy God's precious gift. And the way to make this gift flourish is to celebrate it. Isaiah 58 speaks about making the Sabbath a delight. Is that how you would describe it? A delight? One reformed author says that this requires effort. And he suggests, I quote, go easy on the rulemaking and the restriction. Speak often about the beauty of this day to your children. Go to the house of the Lord with a song in your heart and a spring in your step. End of quote. So find ways to make this a day of celebration. And you can do that in lots of ways. The clothes you wear, the music you listen to, even the food you eat. Such as perhaps enjoying some Sunday treats or some chocolates or some cake that you might not have on another day. Make it a festive day. Make it a joy for your children, for your family. In the end, this is not just about what you do on a day. This is about your relationship with the Lord your God. Key to the Lord's day is to know the Lord of this day, to know Him as your Lord, your Savior, Jesus Christ. Key to this day is about knowing His grace and seeing serving Him not as a burden but as a precious gift, a gift that can be unpacked and enjoyed in faith. Well, what does the way that you are unpacking this gift say about your relationship with the Lord? Today, the Lord himself reminds you, here is my gift. Now go, unpack it joyfully. Make it a true delight. Amen.